All right. I want to welcome everybody to another episode. It is the Rikishi Driver Talk Show, and it is November the 28th, 2020. And listen here, you know, I am so, so excited just to have this Uso, this gentleman, this icon, this legend of the sumo world, sumo king. Um, this cat here um, by the name of Konishki. I like to call him Sale. He's uh, a Samoan brother of ours that I probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, uh, we met Sale in Japan. And it was myself, uh, Yokozuna, and uh, Big Sam. And so we are actually coming through for a wrestling event. And we linked up with this Uso back in the day. And it's been 25 plus years and, uh, you know, fast forward, you know, here we are uh, being able to have a conversation amongst two Samoan brothers uh, that, you know, just went out in the world and took a chance to know what we were going to do. But all we know is our parents is get out there and get it. So, listen, I don't even want to waste any more time about uh uh, my stories about this cat here, but I would like to uh, formally introduce respectfully my Uso, the great sumo king himself, the sumo champion, Konishiki. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> How you doing, my Uso? Talo for lava, my brother. Malo wow. Lava. What's been going on? I want to thank you so much for Tai Lava. Uh, for heavy, bro. Coming on the show. It's so good to see you, my friend. It's been a long time. Thank God to technology. I feel right. like you're next door to me. Yeah, so so uh, tell us tell us uh, what's been happening with you in, in that part of the world. Well, like we all know, we are done with this corona thing going on. Um, um, up to now, uh, it's just like my 39th year in Japan. Wow. I've been retired for almost 21 years now. Um, I officially retired in 97. And ever since then, I've been... Um, um, I left the Sumo Association. I don't belong mm -hmm. to them. I just wanted to start my own my own thing. So I started my yeah. own company, which is called KP, Konishiki Power. Mm -hmm. And um, what it is, is just self-management. I had nobody to manage me. I didn't want anybody to manage my life anymore. Yeah. And the biggest reason was, as you know, as our career goes on, we kind of um, sacrifice our time away from our parents and stuff. And especially my career was always in Japan. So I hardly had... Out of the 16 years, close to 17 years, my career was on. I hardly, I only could see my parents like twice, uh, wow. tw twice a year during my career. Yeah. So the biggest decision I had to make was if I was going to stay with associations, train and have my own stable or move on and just uh, do other things that fun things that I like, I wanted to do and try to do. And, um, and my parents was a huge, uh, a uh, huge reason why I'm doing what I'm doing because I wanted right. to have access to my calendar anytime that I wanted to go and see mom because mom couldn't travel at the time. Already right. when I retired, she was doing dialysis, so she couldn't ever travel anywhere. So I wanted to make sure I was there for Mother's Day, at least spend a Thanksgiving because I haven't done a Thanksgiving with my parents ever since I joined Sumo. And, you know, like Christmas, I at least go to Christmas. So while she was alive, I got to spend a few Christmases, a few Thanksgiving with mom and dad, you know, together. Yeah. So, but that's the big, biggest reason I kind of separated myself from um, from the Sumo Association and actually started my own thing. But I still go around. I go help another Polynesian Uso, Usashi Maru, yeah. that has his stable. He's mm. been running the stable for seven years. I go out and help him coach. Or some of my other boys who are now running the association that are in the top ranks, the CEOs and the they're sitting on the board. I go over and help their boys. They always want yeah. me to come and help because I, I bring, I bring the 
I bring something different to the stables all the time because you know, when you see the same boss every day yelling at them, you know, bring something different. And I'm and I'm on TV all the time, so the kids are joining at like 15, so they don't yeah. want to watch my kids show as kids. So, <clears throat> so I go in there and I try to um, anytime they need help, I would go in and uh, talk to them about sumo and uh, and then the main thing is like anything else is it's not really motivating and, and trying to get their brain or their minds right because at the end of the day they got to know the reason why they're doing whatever they're yeah. doing and why they want to do it you know so once the younger generation understand why you want to get to where you want to go and why you want to and how you want to get there is and not from there they kind of do it on their own they have the energy and the youth to do it to it to it anyway All right so what uh to take it back sally what made you want to become a sumo a wrestler. How did that come about? And what what age did you start? I started eighteen, and it was this is a story I've, I've told because I never known I knew nothing about sumo, but I was oh. cutting out of class with my last my last few oh. weeks of high school. Oh, sorry. <laughs> who's in Waikiki oh. surfing? And somebody who's uh, who opened up the doors for a lot of Polynesians too with uh, Uncle Peter Maivia. You remember, huh. you know the name Curtis the Booyah Kia? Yeah, yeah, Curtis, Uncle, Uncle Curtis. Curtis. Yeah. Well, Curtis was the one that found me. Wow. And because of his experience going to uh, Japan, he was here when uh, Nikki Dozan, the Japanese ex sumo wrestler that became the biggest name in wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Was was actually that's when he, um, the old man Curtis was in in the circuit. Same time with uh, the old man Peter Maivia. Yeah, and so, Uncle Fuji as well. Uncle Fuji, yes, Uncle yeah. Fuji, yes. That, that so he's the one that he had a board. Um, he he sold like rental boards at Waikiki. Yeah, and that's when he retired. He was at the beach every day at the wall, in the wall right by Waikiki. The wall. He's a famous for that's Uncle Curtis wall. <laughs> right. Everybody. So he used to call me when I used to go to class. I used to hate it because you know Polynesian culture. If somebody older call you, you have to respect. You got to go right. Yeah, yeah, so of course. Goes, hey, yeah, man. Come here. So I go, I go, oh, Uncle Harris, what's up, Uncle Curtis? Sit down. I got to talk to you. He goes, you're the number 70, you're the number 79, you play for Pac-5, right? I go, yeah, I play for Pac-5. You should be a sumo wrestler. He goes, not that to me. I thought, Uncle, I don't know nothing about sumo. And he goes <laughs> on and on. He thought, you know, I've been around with Tayo and Kitanomi. You look like Kitanomi. And he's telling me names I never know at the time. Right. So I just listen. Oh, oh really? That's good, eh, Uncle. Wow. I, and because I was cutting class all week, every time I went to the beach, I couldn't get into the water because he got me. He, he put me on the side and everybody's in the water but me. Yeah. So that's where it started. They tell me, you look like Kita Naomi. They tell me, you look like this grand champion. Your legs, your, your fat freaking thighs and your calves, you look like a, and you look like a stump. You you look, you feel like a sumo wrestler. So he told me, and he said, I watch you play football at the a little stadium, high school. So that's where it started. Wow. He kind of talked to me, and then he he introduced me to the pioneer of sumo for all foreigners, Takamiyama, and then mm -hmm. we met up. And I I, don't, I just said, as long as it's free, as long as I don't I don't burn up my family for one penny, I go. Yeah. So he told me everything. Free. Okay, I'm gone. So I didn't even tell my parents. I just went and got my passport, got my visa. Wow. And one week before I was to leave, I told my mom, Ma, I'm going to Japan. Yeah, my mom started crying. Where the hell is Japan? I don't know. I never been there. What you gonna do wow. in Japan? I'm gonna be a sumo wrestler. She tells me, she said, "What the hell is sumo?" I don't know. I'm gonna find out when I get there. <laughs> wow. And I left. I left at 18. <laughs> and so you got there. You're in a whole new foreign country. You don't know anybody there. All you know is the word, the advice that was given to you. Yeah. How did that happen? When you land, then what? So then, no money. No what? money, not a penny to my name. The only thing I had, I didn't even have luggage. I told my parents, they said no need anything, just come. I had a shoulder bag that I used in high school that said Pac-5, the name of a football team. Right. I had The only thing I had in there, I had my Bible, my my photo album of the family and friends. I had a slacks. I had a lower shirt. I thought I was going to wear that uh -huh. when, I get, when I go to, to Japan on a plane. I was supposed to wear that at the airport, but my mom... The night before, she sold me an EFI kanga. Okay. <laughs> so if you look at my first pictures when I left, I have an EFI kanga. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With a, and then she stopped in Waipahu at the Samoan store, and she bought me a shirt that says Samoa. Wow. 
So if you look at my first pictures when I'm leaving, I'm wearing a yellow lava yeah. Samoa, and I'm wearing a cowboy hat with slippers on. That's how I came to Japan. <laughs> <clears throat> and when I got to wow. Japan, I got to Japan <laughs> in Narita. Those days, you had to pay 2,000 yen to get out of the airport tax. Wow. I didn't have money, so I, I asked some locals who was going to pay. Uncle, you can help me out. They thought, what you doing here, young boy? I go, I'm going to be a sumo wrestler. You're going to be a sumo wrestler. Uh, huh. Yeah, I, I'm going to try to be a sumo wrestler. And they, oh, what you eat? Oh, Uncle, I don't want money. They, they went pull out the 2000 and they paid for my they paid for my ticket to get out of the airport. And then when we got out, nobody was there to pick me up, bro, in Arita. Wow. So I go, so Uncle, how do I get to Tokyo? He go, oh, you got to catch the limousine. Oh, okay, okay, just jump on the bus. No, you got to pay. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to money. And then again, they paid 3,500 yen. Wow. And I, Boston, I went down to what they call Hakozaki, the bus station in Tokyo. Uh -huh. That's how I started. And so you oh, went into... My name. Not a penny to your name. None, none, no money. I told my parents, no need worry. No so need I, money. I just want to understand. So you ain't got no money. Yeah. Like everybody's listening to this, you know, what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. You don't have no money. And you have no idea where are you going or what is your plan? Where are you planning to sleep or how did what happened that day? The plan is just get on the plane, go wherever I can go, get to talk and get in touch with uh, Takamiyama. So I okay. that day I got they, they came to the bus station, so they got me at the bus station. And that day, I guess they made it news that I was there's a foreigner coming to Sumo. When I got to the Sumo stable, right. they had a whole Media press conference waiting for me. 18 years old. 18 years old. <laughs> and I don't even know any what the hell's going on. I only right. met Jesse one time, you know. And then that's where it started. I still remember that night. We stayed at a hotel the next morning, jumped on a bullet train. I went to Nagoya. In within yeah. a week, I went official somewhere so already. And so, how, what was your training consistent? Because I'm sure, you know, you didn't know how to speak Japanese. You're kind of the foreign guy. Did you feel any type of way like, damn, it's like them against me? Or, you know, did you feel welcome or did you, you know, feel feel what? Anybody that comes to sumo, no one feels welcome, no matter you're Japanese or foreign. But you're like dirtbag. You do all wow. the cleaning. You do all the washing. You're the last to shower. You're the last to eat. You're the last to sleep. The first to get up. You're the dirtbag of the stable. So it doesn't matter if you're a foreigner or not. The only reason... The only problem is I didn't understand what's going on. I didn't speak speak it, understand it. And, you know, the, the, the question people ask me a lot is, what what do you think helped you get through this, to your career? So at the beginning, so not knowing nothing about my, my career, not knowing nothing about the language and the culture. You know why? Because I was willing to learn whatever was coming. Day yeah, by is. day, I, was, I would like to learn something new and learn something new. I'll get hit in the head by something, but I tell myself, you cannot punch back because that's the law. That's the law in sumo. You know, if somebody tells you to yeah. do something, you, do, you screw up. Bro, like Stone Age, bro. You know, like Samoa, when they tell you to do it, you don't want you sasa. Yeah. Same thing with sumo. They sasa us. Ah. I got hit one oh. time when I only joined sumo. I think it was my second month, third month in sumo. One of, if one guy screws up, everybody is screwed up. So we had like four of us who just joined. And I was the, I was the newest kid. I was the newest kid out of the four. But the other kids were so, all 15 because they can join at 15. I joined 18. So wow. one day, they forgot to take out one of the garbage cans because we have to get up in the morning, 3.30. You mean like doing fails? Doing fails like, yeah. like our culture? Yeah. We okay. had to do that. So I'm used to it, you know. But that was 3.30 in the morning up. We got to clean all four floors, clean all four toilets, take all the rubbish out, make sure. So we forgot one that day. When we right. came back from the sumo school because we go to school for six months, we came back and our senior seniority guy was like, "All right, wait, you guys got this, bro." Everybody got hit with the beer bottles, boom! Wow! And with the beer bottles on our heads, bro. And we cannot say nothing. All he said is, "Ah, uh, arigato What's on this?" Yeah. And that's all he was. So, but that's the kind of thing that motivated me. I always remember that, that senior seniority guy, senior guy's face. I look at it, so I go, "See my son, but you me, tell him, brother, I'm killing you at practice tomorrow, bro." So that's yeah. the motivation I had, and I was. I was so, like, I couldn't sleep. My first two years, I couldn't sleep, man. I would wake up bleed, bleeding on my pillow because I guess the stress in me. Yeah. And I was so fired up, I couldn't stress, I couldn't sleep. So I would, like, 
go down to the practice area like 3 30 in the morning just to warm up work out before anybody come and when people came i was killing guys my first six months i was i bet i went beat half of the stable guys already i was like killing guys and now I, I came in fierce i i wanted to kill people every day wow i hate to say that but that's the motivation so after six months of see they seeing me just growing into the sport, nobody treat me like shit anymore. Right. Okay. You, swear say that in your show. No, you're fine. You're, you're fine. <laughs> so you you basically, you know, from eighteen you come in there, you're killing everybody, you don't know how to speak Japanese. You kinda adapt to the culture because the culture is similar to our Fasamo exactly. culture doing Fayaus. Exactly. So that it that didn't phase you at all. At all. You know? No. And so from 18, how long did it take for you to turn pro? Like you finally, you know, you're in front of the, the crowd now. Likishi, I still hold a record for the fastest to come from zero and come up to the high rank. It took me eight tournaments, wow. which is less than a year and a half. Usually a guy will make it from, from zero where I started, yeah. average maybe five to seven years. Year and a half, eight terms, I still hold a record today. The other record I'm proud of is being a junior champion within 14 tournaments. Just two years and two months, I was a, I was a junior champion. Never been broken yet. Wow. Well, congratulations. Before I, before I could even speak Japanese, I was up there. So I was take, doing interviews, and that's the other thing I got in trouble for. Because they're interviewing me in Japanese, and I'm trying to answer with all the little Japanese I know. And there's an interview, even till today, they talk about... Oh, I said, I was trying to say it. in me, every day I had this fighting spirit. Yeah. This spirit in me, actually, because I represent my family, and I, and I will die for my family, and and I, I always want to fight. So when I said fight, they translated the word to, like, typical Japanese word, the kenka, means it's fight, which is, they say, well, sumo is a very secret sport. You, you know, you cannot say stuff like that. And I got in trouble for that too. So like, <laughs> so I, before I could even learn the language, I was in, in you know in the top rank and stuff. Wow. So well, I was we... in the top rank for most my, my, my whole career, most of. So finally, finally now, when did you kind of see the difference of the Japanese people start to treat you different, like with uh, with love and respect? I think after getting up into the the, the first rank. I, I stayed there for like four tournaments. I got yeah. into a um, championship because at the lower ranks, you, you 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 do seven matches out of the 15 yeah. days. But once you get into the top rank, it's 15 days. So that was my first uh, experience doing 15 days. So I was in that level for four tournaments and I went straight up to the top level. And then my second, and then I, was, I wasn't feeling any pressure because I wasn't understanding Japanese yet. Hmm. So I couldn't, nothing really kind of um, kind of uh, hold me back. Nothing wasn't uh, distracting me at all. My focus was so, I know where I wanted to go and what I, what I wanted to do. Now that I'm a high ranker, I don't have to do all the dirty job. I have people scrubbing my back, doing my chores, cleaning my room. You yeah. have servants there, you know, apprentices and stuff. So I like had like six. And so now I can focus more about, about my about me and then after practices of course we got to do things for the stable but every time i had yeah. a chance i started going back to to the weight room because i used to be a power lifter yeah I started going back to the weight room started playing a lot of basketball started playing running doing all the little things i used to do in high school for extra training out of sumo yeah. so i did all the extra things after that after that and then and once i got i guess once i got into the the top level and only in our second tournament i almost won the empress cup on my second tournament and um i think that's from there the people i could feel the crowd the fans are like in a shock right but at the same time they don't know how to react to this foreigner who's just coming in and kind of changing the history of sumo right but i i, st I started to understand the media and and all you all you could find there was like so much things against me against me yeah there yeah. was like they, they had stuff <laughs> like uh Put you wasn't you wasn't supposed to be the guy to to, to rise up with that level, you know. Yeah, so and, like I think to me, I could understand. You know, it's like yeah. having somebody who doesn't never a Japanese kid never played football. You put him in a you put him in college and he become a Heisman Trophy winner. Like sure. everybody will be shocked. You know what I mean? So sure. I could understand. So things like that really didn't bother me. I, I didn't. I was so 
focused and understood what I could control and what I couldn't control. Yeah. So that didn't really bother me. As things go by, I was like feeling, wow, how come they're thinking that way? You know, and, and then I had to kind of evaluate what I do and how 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 would I see things if I was in the opposite on the right. other side of the fence. So that's kind of, uh, that's where I get my comfort zone from is trying to um, see me from the outside, you know. Right. I don't know if you do that, but I do that all the time. Even now when I do shows and stuff, I go home, I couldn't sleep because I critique myself. I can't actually picture my whole night, that hour and a half show I did, and I'll yeah. picture myself like, oh, I should have said this differently. I might hurt somebody by joking this way, you know, stuff like that, you know. Yeah, but you, I was had. you know, the way I feel about things like that, you know, we're in the public eye. So it's damn if we do, damn if we don't. Mm. Anything we say, there's always somebody that's going to throw rocks at us. To me, my thing is just to be myself. What you see is what you get. You know, we all know our professions and stuff. We're human like everyone else. You know, we make mistakes. But it doesn't mean that, you know, we're the we're the bad type of people that they say. But everybody has their job to do. The media has their job. You know, we got our job to do. And, and exactly. it is what it is. So, but listen. So I tell every people all the time, like, you know, even in the wrestling business, uh, this is my cousin right here, blah, 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 you know, the big Konishki, you know, the champion. So let's, you know, I tell them some stories about me, you, and Big Sam. Yeah. Uh, let, let's <laughs> let's give the listeners some stories. What is your 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 favorite story uh, uh, with Big Rodney and uh, Big Sam back in Japan? Those, I, know, yeah, I know we yeah. ate a lot. <laughs> Not only that, I mean... When you were went there one time, him, the Katonka, I took yeah. them out to drink a Roppongi. Oh, Lord. So, <laughs> Samu told me, Soli, these guys are all drunk. I had some of the sumo Musashi Maru all drunk in the, yeah. in the bar. So, these guys started all standing up. Musashi Maru started saying, come on, let's do it, guys. Like, uh -oh. all my, I only go to bars that my friends own, so I know. So all my friends, all their friends, is like everybody started walking out. Like, okay, no worry, dude. We just took the bar over. So that wasn't a problem. Was after that, someone would call me out. Sole, you gotta go get the kind. Come on, Ronnie. He's not listening. I thought, oh. why? What's the matter? The freaking guy. He went drinking an auto bar. He went drinking an auto bar. And he's, he's by himself. What bar? Yeah, he were poking by the chair. I said, don't worry. I go grab him. So I go in. I go in the bar. I grab him. Sole, Ronnie, let's go. Oh, man, I gotta drink. Hey, let's go. I just grab him. I put him out of the bar. I show him my car. I take him to KO Plaza Hotel. Get out of the car. You get him to go to sleep. I don't want you to get in trouble. Come on. We we, we we had so much fun drinking with these guys, man. Yeah. We, we became real close. When Rodney first, that was back in the day when Rodney was Coquina. Coquina, you, yeah. you know way before. But when Rodney became Yokozuna, and we still have this framed up. The first kimono that Ronnie came on exactly. WWE was your kimono. Because yeah. he, tell it what he would say, damn, what am I going to wear? I said, well, call Konisky. Maybe you can get something from him. Yeah. And that's when you sent him that kimono there. Yeah. I went, actually, I went and, I went and got him. I went and got him. I went to Kill Plaza. I still remember. In fact, I was just talking about that because I was writing, I was talking about it about my book after, yeah. before you came on. I said, yeah, he's the guy, because the guy who's writing the book, he's a big wrestling fan. I, I said, yeah, right. you know, Kokina, yeah, he, he, he when he, he, I knew before anybody he was, that he was going to go WWF because he called me up. I went to Kill Plus to his room. I took all the, the kimonos and uh, Obi, they call it an Obi. <laughs> yeah. For, for him, he said, he said, so I want to have a gimmick or sumo gimmick. Really? What kind? They go call me the Yokozuna. I go, wow, that's cool. Yeah, I need kimonos. Uh, okay, wait, I'm coming. So I, yeah, I grabbed the stuff. I went, I, I, we talked up. I know because you guys stay at Kill Plaza a lot. That's when we used to hang out with Sam too and stuff. So I went yeah. and took, I took stuff. And even your brother, um, Umanga too, when he, he, he came, we used to hang out. In fact, all the, all the Polynesian fighters from Sam, from Hunt, yeah. uh, Mark Hunt, Sefo, all those guys, they all used to take them all out. Uh, you know, all that's a... Fight. You know, so that's a beautiful thing, you know, to when we have all type of uh, usos like us that we can all come together, and you know, you know, to to hear the stories mm. of each of our path was a different way, but mm. we all come from the same culture. Yeah, uh, it's that fasa more. It's that you know, it's that strong style to where you know, we we don't quit. Yeah, we don't quit. We don't know. Too. We don't know where we're going. What are we gonna do? But we want to win. We want to win yeah. by all means. Cause uh, 
by all means necessary. And to to keep up with guys like, you know, yourself and also, you know, uh, Mark Hunt and so mm. forth. And even I'm, I've been uh, talking to David Tua on the side too as well. Yeah. So I, I hopefully that one day that we can all get together. I think it's very important that, you know, guys like ourselves uh, to be able to get together and go around to do motivational speaking to a lot of yeah. our, our youth, our students throughout the world, because our stories, you know, I, I come from the Bay Area, born from the Bay Area, mm. the streets of San Francisco from a poor, poor family. What is you that know? church you guys used to run? Oh, we're a first congregational church in, uh, yeah, in Sagamore. Francisco. That was my uh, my grandfather, Nguayi yeah. Tonai, the well, late reverend. <laughs> you know, when I was in, in junior high school, I was for Aluma for our church. We went to Isinga. Church oh. Isinga. That was uh, 1979 or something like that. Yeah. And I my, was in the church because we stayed at the hall. Ah, okay. My there grandfather was, was, he was the first... Uh, uh, first time on to put up a church in San Francisco. Yeah, he was. And I'm talking. I'm talking the early '70s, man. We're yeah. going way back. And then he used to go up and down the Bay Area, all up and down the coast of California. Mm. Yeah, you know, different I'm places. Makaloku, yeah, Makaloku here, there, and 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 every and years later, here we are today. So, you know, it's a yeah. good thing. So. So listen, back to the Yokozuna with Rodney. Hmm. People want to know how much sushi or how much, what was a dinner night for you guys? Bro, like $3,000. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're living like average, kings. Sumo average, kings. Like like beer, bro, they can go on and on and on. Like, like you can no matter how much beer you have, it doesn't matter because I, I could drink at this time too. I was drinking like heavily. Yeah. I would drink like six bottles of tequila, six bottles of vodka at a sitting, yeah. bro. Because I couldn't get drunk with beer. So I would drink tequila or vodka. Rodney them, they sing, they drink anything, whiskey, whatever, man. But wow. I only could drink whiskey, uh vodka and we put away some gallons of beer, bro. A lot, of sushi, a lot of sushi. Sushi, bro. Whatever. You, they love Niku because, you know, Japan, they have the best yaki Niku, right? Yeah. Korean barbecues. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think we ate up a couple cows, bro. <laughs> so, you like, you like, you yeah, like I've been there. A kongai, bro. <laughs> you know how that is. Kongai is yeah. Sunday's biggest, Samoa's biggest meals is on Sunday after church. Bro. I know, man. I can't eat that anymore like that, you know. Same uh, here, bro. How how is I know you've been going through I, you've I've seen the trans, transformation of your body, mm. and you look you look well you look great now. How how what happened? Did you start like for me? I start to feel the after effects of the business. Mm. You know my my elbows my bones hurt. You know carrying the weight that I was carrying and so forth. Mm. So what made you do the? How did that come about with you? For me, you know. I was so used to being big, like you know, you you Polynesian, we can handle our weight, right? Yeah. So I was always, you know, after sumo, um, I've been fluctuating back and forth. So I was like the heaviest I was, about like six hundred fifty or something like that. I was really heavy, but Are I really you... had bad knees and bad shoulders from sumo. So, and but I don't know what was keeping me going because I kept on traveling all over the world. I was flying to Africa, flying to Turkey. And I was flying as that big, right. you know, and all the stuff. But uh, this one time I told, uh, my wife told me, you know what, you just got to, I told her, my, and one of my good sisters, she she works with the medical industry, Sally, I can help you. You just go do the gastric bypass. The thing will help yeah. you. And I'm pretty healthy. I, I'm not on medication. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have diabetic. Yeah. You know, I don't have any um uh, Bad syndrome. I don't have medication. I was really a healthy guy, so I thought, oh, yeah, I'm gonna have to take a whole year off from work, and then I went and just focus on trying to do that. Yeah. So I went home. I, I stayed in Hawaii. I, I and I, I I lost like a hundred pounds on my own just by exercising in the pool and eating right and stuff like yeah. that. Then I did, and then a year later I did the surgery, and then I lost all the weight, and then and from there I just try to keep it off, but still now I still struggle with the weight. You know, and the thing I've been doing the past five years is I do a lot of uh, fasting. So I try yeah. to do it like twice or three times a year. Yeah. And my I do fasting maybe the shortest five days, the longest two weeks. 
and and I like fasting. I feel better when I fast. Yeah. So it's, it's the same thing. You're just fighting. Um, just the thing I tell myself: just don't stop doing it. You know, even though you fluctuate, but try to go back. Because I do doctor checkups and stuff. You know how it is when you never did, you never believe in the doctor checkups. Yeah. But now, you you know, you kind of don't want to be uh, that whole uh, Mr. King Kong anymore. Okay, okay, I gotta yeah. go doctors. You know, do the checkup because. I was just talking about that, about the book. I said the hardest thing I've, I don't know, probably you going through the same thing too, is we, we, we've learned how to fight pain so much. Amen. And that, that thing that we learn to get us to where we are, where we're in our careers, is the same struggle we get to try to release that. Right. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. And like I would fight pain. I can be like hundred something fever. I'll never take medication because I'll fight it. Yeah. And I I've been doing that so much that you know, I actually uh, put myself yeah. in danger and stress out my wife because don't no need. I I can I can I can get over it. I can get over it. I go fight it. I go fight it. And I'm like shaking and freezing yeah. and you know, and I finally learned how to you know just listen to your body if it, if it's painful. Go get some help, you know. Yeah. But before, through my sumo career, I tell you, I did a lot of things just to. I didn't. I didn't. I don't know what it was. I think your mind is so strong. Fuck it. This is part of it. You just gotta take yeah. the pain and go on. What, and you, you know, when you after that, like right now, it's just learning how to release and let that go because you're trying to be a normal person, normal body person. You know, you're not yeah. that. You're not that super athlete you was before. So it's just trying to change your mindset because your mind was so my mind was so strong but the good thing about that mindset it helped me in my business now it's nothing i, I there's nothing i'm afraid of to do in my business once i think yeah. of something i do it no matter what nothing will stop me from this so i took the good of it and put it in another place but i found a way to kind of release it with how i strong enough to try to handle pain i don't want to fight with pain no more yeah yeah but i do fight with pain both of my shoulders are bust up Finally got my knee surgery and my left surgery this year, so um, hopefully I can get everything in place by sixty. Right on. I got three more years to try to get placed everything in, and get you know get smaller, I guess. Well, I'm glad to see you're doing well, my brother. I mean, all your stories that you know we're talking about, you know, Polynesian people in general, we love to eat, and you know sometimes yeah. I have a hard time, you know, when we get together for kongai and stuff. You know, you see the Kalo, you see the Fospovi, you see the Muli Pipi. And then on top of that is the mayonnaise, you know, the best food mayo. And then it's like, it's e uma, steroids. Yeah, e uma, so, so, yep. So, after, after you eat, after you eat, you always tell, you, you wish you never eat the food, huh? <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I just had dinner last night. I had dinner with two Samoan guys who fight the house over here. So uh, we, once in a maybe once a year we they call me Sole, name Talo and Missy. Told me, Sole, you gotta come over have dinner. I told, well, I got time tomorrow. I told them like actually tomorrow was the day. I told, I come over. I'll bring some stuff. I marinate some chicken. I come and cook it at the house. So you know you had this you had this three Samoan guys. Yeah, they eating they eating the chicken. They get we found some kalo. We found some fai. Uh, so, we made the fai Oh, that's the it's bomb funny, right we there. We just did that last night. Oh my goodness! Well, you know, uh, you 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 know, you and I know we we can't eat that stuff. Maybe once in yeah, once in a while. Hardly, hardly, you know. You know, my, my diet is more like fish, man. Now I eat a lot of fish. Yeah, I eat a, a lot of fish at home. We hardly, you know, I'm I eat really healthy. I'm glad yeah. I live here because everything in Japan is more like small portions and yeah, veggie veg related related and a lot of fish, right? So. Well, you know, Solid. So, how's your book? When's the book coming out? Well, I'm. I want to make it because um, I don't want to rush it. I kind of um, start marketing it or pub get some publicity for it from next year in June. Okay. But I want to release it the day, the year after. You know okay. why? Because I'm actually celebrating my um, my 40 years in Japan. In All right. 20, 2022. You know, and then right now I'm actually uh, putting together a big show. Um, thank you, Japan. It's when Japan Japanese is called Kansha, Konishiki Kansha 
Kansha show, which is I'm trying to put Kansha. together two shows. Yeah, and I'm going to take over um, the Sumo Arena. Yeah. And I'm going to run it for two days because I'm going to make it a two-day event with different performances from different cultures. And just to um, yeah. let Japan be thankful for, for Japan in my life, yeah. you know, for 40 yeah. years. So right now, as I'm doing all this stuff, I'm actually planning a two-day event wow. it's going to be something real crazy and hopefully i can release the book the same day and actually we're doing it the day that i got to japan june 18th and 19th wow. that's so that's history. the days i left i left hawaii 20 years ago it's going to be really 20 years ago the year after next year so, well i look forward to being there my friend yeah we got uh, to do. I'm, I'm trying to put together everything together in my brain yeah and and because i want to the, the first day is concert which is all, I want to be a representative of all the foreigners are in Japan. Thankful yeah. for Japan for the opportunity for giving all the foreigners sure. a place to live, the place to make it, and stuff like that. So it's it's going to be dealing with a lot of different cultures and, and the different prefectures in Japan where they have different dances and stuff. And everybody has sure. to come in kimono. So I'm going to have to make sure everybody comes in the tradition kimono. <laughs> Shit, you, and, you you do that on that day, you'd be running for president or mayor for the whole J Japan or something, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe Trump can come. <laughs> <laughs> no <comment. laughs> so listen, uh, so, you know, you, you've been doing, uh, another thing I've been seeing, you've been doing music, you know, uh, a while. You, you You're into your clothing line. You've been doing some acting, and you also have a kids' show, right, in Japan? Yes. The kids' show I've been doing for 18 years. Wow. I'm still doing it. It's like the number one kids' show in Japan. It's education. Oh. It's like Sesame Street. Oh. And then um, the other thing I've been doing for the past 20 years, I'm a DJ. I have, a radio, I have my radio show. Wow. I do a radio show every week. And and then the closing line is this, as you can see. Mind the hair. So. Got you. Oh, no worries. I like it. Okay. And then Lichi, Lichi is this like, mm -hmm. but this is the the first hat. I got your hat. I'm gonna send it when I go to Hawaii. Anyway. No worries. There's the website right there, Sally. This is the second second design. Okay. You got Lichi. And then you. you have those the hoodies you coming up there. It's the the mm. art behind this guy. It's a famous art, Fude art guy. Let, let's get a big shot on that one right there, huh? Let me see the shot of the t-shirts. Yeah. Uh, Sally's holding that. Konitsky's holding it up right there. Yeah. Okay. This is just one of the designs. This photo was taken in, in um, what? In Germany, one of our tours. Oh, okay. But it's it's Japanese fude, the 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 brush. This guy is so famous. He does all the biggest art for. He was doing all the artwork for the Olympics, right? In Japan. So I, I got to collaborate with him with all the art that I get on my um look on at this one from him. Look at this one I got. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. You got the first one. Look. And that's the look. Yep. Right yep. there. You know, my sister Berta came back from uh, Japan. Oh, by the way, I want to say thank you so much. She could not stop my nephew Lance. I mean Larry could not stop. He's a big fan. And he's always wanted to go to a dojo. He wanted to see how these guys practice. really, really train and practice, right? Mm. Man, he was blown away. They, they, he could not stop talking about it. You mm. know, he says, oh, my goodness. And when I told him I knew you, he says, yeah, right. He already know who you were as far as, you know, being a, a sumo champion. Mm. And when he got to see you and then the other Uso that was there as well. Sashimaru. Sashimaru. Mm. Oh, the kid was blown away. So I want to thank you for looking after you know, my sister and nephew out there, they cannot stop talking about it, you know. I'm glad we did it. Glad we did it. They came in the perfect timing, too, because the tournament was here. And yeah. I got to get them to go to the stable in the morning. And we had some dinner at a, at a real <laughs> sumo restaurant. And I was trying to tell my sister, tell Larry to go train right there. You see how big he was. He's a yeah. good guitar player. He's a good artist. but I know. He was playing yeah. guitar this way. Yeah, well, there you go. They all say so. Say, oh, so cool. You know, he's a big boy, man. All right, so, so, so you got anything else going on now? Since, I mean, damn it, you're about doing everything, you got a long list of of stuff going on. I created my old barbecue sauce. Oh, man, can we get a big shot of that? Uh, 
I see it. There you go, right there. So it's marinade sauce. So uh huh. It's a different ways in the package. All I have to do is put your meat in this package. Right. You throw all the meat in there, and then you, there's a sauce, 250 gram of sauce in there. You right. throw in the sauce. You marinate it overnight. You put it in the icebox. When barbecue the next day, you just pull it out and put it on a fire. And how can people get a hold of that? How, how, how can we get it's a hold on, of that? It's on that baseline, I think, right? Um, okay, the bottom on clicker? On the site, the one he showed. It's it's on that same uh, site. Got it. Got but, it. Um, okay. I created this sauce last year. And I was scheduled to do tours all over Japan this whole year. I was, right. like, booked to the butt. And I was, like, ready to, to throw down because I, I was so excited because I created my own sauce last year. And then when Corona happened, every, everything got canceled. So everything right. had canceled because it's all events and promotions. So, so what I did, the government said, can everybody kind of uh, play low and stay low-key and try not to travel or try not to move around, stay home kind of thing? So I stayed home, you know, I listened. For three months, I didn't even open my front door. I just stayed in the house. And, yeah. and then when I when when they said you can actually move around, I called all my friends all over Japan. I thought I'm coming with my barbecue sauce. Pick a day. All I all you have to do is get all the meat. I'm gonna send you the list of what you should get, and I will come the day before marinate, and I will cook for you guys all day. Wow! So I you know how much spots I did? Forty four from Okinawa all the way down to Hokkaido. I did, yeah. and I I got two more to do. And wow. you know how much sauce I've sold on my own, like you know, like how old school from your girl, from your from your trunk, from your tailgate, yeah, from your trunk, ten thousand pieces I sold already. The grind, the hustle is real, my <laughs> friend. If you want to get, if you want to get shit done right, you got to do it what yourself. Hey, the old man said, if you sit and wait, nothing comes to you. Get your Amen. ass out of your house and stop moving. Go find it. Amen. And that's Absolutely. how it is, bro. I never, and that's why I actually created my own company because I didn't want people to do things for me. I want to do anything myself. And I, when I do shows, I don't even hire a, a stage manager. I do it myself. Hands I do on. the emceeing myself. I do the stage managing myself. And I perform yeah. the last 40 minutes. You know, even the music thing too. I just did this collaboration. It's been so good with my barbecue sauce, using my connection. All my friends too, man. It's just, and they're so happy. They freak out. They're, no worry. I just come and do the sauce. I bring my own sauce and I do everything. I marinate that food. I, and I do like different, six different recipes. And I do it all myself. They just buy all the the products and stuff. So I go there. I fly there on my own. I, I do my promotion with, with my friends because I we're not allowed to do events. So I thought, well, the next best thing is to you host a barbecue and I come. I'm just right. coming to visit you guys. So. I've done that, and I and I, I told my and wife they probably they like be, that. It doesn't cost them any money. Yeah, you're gonna come, so, but and the backside is that you're introducing your product. Yes, and that's the most, yeah. and that's what promotion is all about. It's getting a product yeah. out there, get yeah. as much as you can when you promote, because that's what promotion is all about. And the good thing yeah. about it, I'm not paying anybody for it. I I and yeah. and I'm not getting paid for it too. So, but the good thing about them. I prove all these guys wrong. They tell them, how are you going to get the product? No worry, I'm going to move it myself. And they, lo they look at me like, yeah, but we can get them in the stores, but they cannot push it because you cannot do promotion. It don't matter. I am the promotion. I'm yeah. moving myself. Right. So they were like surprised. Like ten, We started in June, and by the end of September, 10,000 pieces were sold already. Man, you need to bring that. You know, another thing that I've seen you uh, were doing, when you came out to Los Angeles, I think Seattle, New York, you Whoa. did that sumo, uh, man. Listen, we've been to a lot of. I've been to a lot of events and so forth, mm. but I've never seen an idea like that. That was damn genius, you know, right, to be able to bring yeah. something like that and 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 uh, have the American people see firsthand, because you yeah. really only see that on TV or YouTube, yeah. unless you come to Japan. But to have that in our arenas out here in America, yeah. uh, that was genius, man. But you know, and you know, thing, uh, you know, that it was so touching because I, I, I didn't, I hate traveling already. I, you know, I did so much traveling. I just told myself that. But when that came out, I, I, I met with the promoter. I thought, let's talk about it. And then you know, we fought a little bit. I thought, bro, you're a promoter. You don't know nothing about all the shit you guys been doing all this month. So I don't. That's the reason I stayed away from it. Yes, you guys representing the damn sport. It's not even a sport to us. It's a culture. It's right. about respect in the sport. 
I don't want to be one, one of these guys where you guys, it's like popsicle. You guys just trying to sell this thing like you pop. I see it all the time on the internet. The fuck you guys, you guys, you, re and if I'm representing it, we're going to do it right. So I was like, right. you like, I, you know, typical promoter, I feel poker, but we want to do it like this. Bro, if you right, don't you're the product. Like shit, how much money you got, I ain't doing it. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you're I the pro him, <laughs> Go ahead. I told him I would actually do it for free if you guys would do it the way I want to do it. I don't care. I want to put, I want people to really see the real thing and have real summer actually doing an exhibition so they understand why we're so flexible and what kind of life we live. So, right. you know, I was I was um, really um, touched by, we went through it. We did 11 shows. We did Seattle, LA, and New York. New York, like, sold out. And they all sold out. Wow. I was, like, shocked because, wow, it sold out. And, like, you know, I never... I, I don't I don't picture beyond the, the show. Sell, no sell, it doesn't really matter to me. I just wanted to do it. But to see it work out the way it did, uh, it was very... And the last show, there's a video of me talking to my wife. I'm, well, I, so I'm worn out. And I'm yeah. tired, but, you know, I'm so glad we did it. So because we did that, there's so much request now. Like, people yeah. been calling me from Abu Dhabi, from Canada, from Australia, and... It's, and the U.S. too. In fact, we're planning to have 23 shows this year. Well, hell, I'm a big fan of your idea of that show. I think that show needs to be on the main stage, such as Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a big casino there that is, is featured that show like that. And that show there, you know, again, it, you know, only you come, know, bro. only it's you know come. what what it means to you. Yeah, the it's it's more so of introducing the culture to the American people and to the world. Yeah that they have no idea of. And then, you know, to be able to have some, as far as here in, the, in America, that's like new entertainment for for them. We, the same thing in every arena. It's the same thing over and over. But when you came with that idea right there, mm. that was that was genius. Very, very, very good it mind thing. Really well. You know, the thing, I, the thing I noticed, you know, in all Asia, I think Japan is very well known. And yeah. people are curious about Japan. So the thing I noticed about them, they know the culture, very calm, very like do themselves. And I didn't try to make it where it's like, wow, wow, wow. I told them straight up. So yeah. I noticed our found something that they can be comfortable watching. We're not going crazy, like over crazy. Because right. like for your wrestling, it's more about getting everybody crowded going, right? It's the yeah. same thing with that. But the thing is, it's more calm because I want them to understand the rituals that we go through. Right. Because it is a lot of rituals within it. So once they understand the little basic things, why they do a certain thing, why they throw the salt, yeah. and why yeah. they stump their feet, and why they do that ceremony. And, the, and they'll be surprised. These kids are getting flipped. So bad on, on and because I don't you guys think sumo is just pushing and shoving. No, we have 80 different holes. It's the mixture of yeah. aikido, karate, judo, and wrestling. So so you know it's mixed martial wow. art. You guys talk about mixed martial arts. Sumo been way before that. Wow. Miss Martial UFC just came out yesterday. You sumo has been here way forever. And that's the mixture. That's what's the mixed martial art of, of Asia, sumo. So wow. when you explain that, you're actually schooling your, your fans when you're seeing it in the front of it and getting schooled because I have the mic all through the two hours and a half show and right. explain every little uh, detail about what it's all about and how big the ring is and, and how many tournaments we have in Japan and who, who makes it, who don't make it, you know. They're like yeah. surprised. They thought like there's like hundreds of, yeah, there's a hundred and thousand sumers, but there's only 60 can make it. Wow. I and, would and say actually... They would have never knew. They would have yes. never knew if you would so have, like, you know, yeah, educated. It's like a shock. What? You're professional, yeah. but you don't get paid. Yeah, you don't get paid. You just only the top six to get paid. So all wow. these little details is a lot of information. I think we live in a world of information. The more information, real information, the real, what we call real reality, not the bullshit they have on TV reality show. They act everything else. And, you know, as long yeah. as you have a booty, you can sell shit. But I don't, I don't want to tell my booty. It's not about my booty. It's about the reality. It's about truth. And people are actually looking for real stuff anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, you definitely, <laughs> again, my also, you definitely uh, a motivational with your story from an 18 year old kid that flew from Hawaii to Japan, a foreign country. They didn't have a dollar to his name. 
a backpack, didn't know how to speak Japan. And then fast forward 30 something years later, here we are sitting talking to an icon of the sumo wrestling champions. <laughs> so my goodness, I want to thank you also. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I know your scheduling is busy um, and just continue to uh, continue to live, continue to shine continue to motivate and just know that I appreciate everything that you have done for me, my whole entire family, and just you being you. I, that's what I love about um, Kuniski Saleh is this, you just straight down to earth. Also, and uh, I hope our stories here and your story, that's able to those that are listening around from the world that are able to know this, that listen, anything is possible. If you're able to put your mind to it and just exactly go for it. Yep. All right. It's important to have a purpose, a reason. Once you find a purpose and a reason, that shouldn't be, and you just got to walk the walk, man. You know, if you really want it, you know, if you really want it when you start hurting. Yeah. And that pain is good pain. Don't yeah. worry about it. You, you, you get through it. You know, if you don't get any pain, you're not feeling, you, you're not feeling, you're not on the right path to the way I think, you know, so everything comes with pain mentally, physically. Yeah. Same thing. But, Learn how to take the pain and go with it. There's certain times in your in your in your age racket that you can do that. Like for me and brother Dikishi, we are more like trying to inspire more people and um, do what we can with what we have right now because we're much older guys. Um, our our peak of our careers, we we went through it, and we know how it is to fight the yeah. pain to get through it. You know, so yeah. And um, I, I had this conversation with my friend's daughter because she's half someone half Japanese. And she goes, oh, uncle, what is the Fa Samoa? Well, Fa Samoa is when you, you you dedicate your life to your family. Amen. And then you need, I tell them, the three C's that I always try to tell young people about is the, the courage to commit to conquer. Courage to commit to conquer. What that means is if you don't have the courage to commit, then you won't work. But once you commit it, you're going to learn how to conquer whatever is in front of you. And her problem was she she now understands Samoan culture. So, but the first time more you leave for your family, and there's two ways you can deal with. It, I told them because I talked to a lot of young kids, a lot of my nephews and friends, kids about they talk ask me how, how do I get over this uncle? Because they're worried about our first time more, like you know, yeah. fall of love is the f word, you know, fall of love is. They yeah. learn, they grow up learning the wrong ways, or they get the wrong idea. Like, oh man, they're gonna be asking me for money again. Ask me for yeah. So now I tell them, okay. For you, you have to make a choice. For me, I made a choice because I wanted to do good for my parents. Well, everything I make, I wanted to give everything I made to my parents to help them. So I knew where it was. So now, if you cannot handle that, walk away from it. If it's going to help you with your career, to take you to the next level, to better yourself in the career you choose, walk away. But always remember to come back. Yeah. Because... A lot of kids, I, I think you know that I know, we both know a lot of our a lot of our Polynesian kids, that's where they that's where they shrink or that's where they fall off the cliff because they cannot handle that Samoa style. But they feel what do you yeah. call it? Not depressed, but suppressed by our culture. Yeah. yeah. Le malablama, is, le malablama. Oh, but yeah. yet so how do we how do how do we counter that? How do we yeah. uh, try to motivate them in a different way? I just thought there's two yeah. choices. Yeah. You're gonna have to um, work hard for for your family, or you're gonna say, "Nah, I just gonna do my own thing." Lot, but if but I tell them, if that helps you to get good in whatever you choose to do, do it, because your parents at the end of the day want you to do good. Period. Right. They mean good for you. But you know, we different age, us, we, we understand that and we're gonna do whatever we can to help our Inga, which is good and bad for, for the younger generation because they, they don't know how to take it, yeah. So it's so well, important to they they to all agree. have a, they all have a choice. <laughs> Every single person has a choice of uh which direction that they want to take their uh take their life accordingly. You yeah. know, they, they know some understand the culture. Like I, I have kids as well. And grandkids that are born here in the United States. Mm. Yeah, it's some type of way. So at the mm. same time, you know, I still have to, you know, yeah. 
The yep. culture is a beautiful culture, it yeah, is, but it's it also is. it's also confusing too at times to the new era today. Me and you, we get it, you know, yeah, because we come from nothing. Yeah, by the exactly. time my by the time my kids come into, there's no struggle. They, exactly. they, they don't have a struggle, you know. It's the fruits of your father's labor that you're doing well today. So, uh, but for those that are less fortunate, hey, mm. you know, you you have a choice to go, and always the right way is the right way. The, the the left side, if you're going down that alley that you know you're not supposed to, that lane, well, you already know. You you kids are grown adults now, and you yep. understand which 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 is the positive way to take. So yes, sir. So Sally, listen, we got you know my time is up for today. I want to say thank you with utmost respect, my also thank for, for taking the me. time for coming through. So thank you for having me. Do you have any last words before we go out? God is good all the time, every time. Okay, brother. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you got the Sumo King. That's our show for tonight. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for coming through. I love you, Uso. Love you too, well, brother. I'll fucking yeah. hang up. Yes, sir. Likewise. Mm. So, wow. Okay, let me uh, let me close up our show here. I want to thank everybody for joining in. Unbelievable. I mean, uh, probably out of, you know, I'm just speechless, man, to be able to sit here and chop it up with uh, with my Uso here, Koniski, an icon in the sumo business, the sumo world. Well, there you have it, man. I think, you know, tonight's episode, I hope it motivated a lot of you guys that are out there, a lot of you kids uh, that are out there, even grown adults, man, that ain't doing right, uh, you know, going down that path. That, you know, you hear the story of him being 18 years old, going to a foreign country. That blew my mind, let alone Japan, where it's a different language. And he was able to, you know, to pull through. You know, he was able to pull through. And years later, here he is. He cemented his legacy in the sumo world. So with utmost respect, thank you. Thank you so much, Sally, for coming through. And I hope that you kids uh, have learned something from this show here tonight. That all you got to do is believe, man. All you got to do is believe. If you believe in yourself, go for it. Because tomorrow ain't promised. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, this is my time for tonight. I want you guys to have a safe weekend out there. Uh, be safe and uh, be good to one another. Make sure you hit and like and share uh, this video here. Share it all to your pages, to your fans, to your friends your grandma, your papa, and also show some love if you got a second. There is the cash app up top to your right, right up here, right up there, right there. There you go. Here you go, right there. <laughs> There's a the cash app. You can send out a donation if you like. In the meantime, this is Rikishi. Y'all be good to each other. Remember, it's just free, absolutely free to be kind. Good night.